Let's talk about releasing, actually. Um, let's talk about grounding. Let's talk about, you asked about, who asked about grounding? You asked about grounding. So uh, grounding and feeling. This is something I learned from a gentleman named Carl Wolf. I actually ran into an old, um, another student of Carl's last night at the bungalow of all places. Um, and uh, we started chatting for a bit. And, and Carl had the ability to understand feeling and embodiment. He could see it on people like nobody's business. You know, he was amazing at that. Um, and so what is it? And this is a really big contribution to releasing, is this depth of feeling and embodiment, being able to feel deep in your body. Why is this so important? Because the deeper you can feel without dramatizing and analyzing your emotions, just letting them flow, the deeper you can feel the flow through your body of all these different energies and sensations, the faster and deeper your releases will go. If you're just concentrating from the head on releasing, you're not gonna get very far. If you feel the heart, you'll get, you'll get pretty far. But if you start feeling the whole body, the stomach, the turn on, the legs, the girth beneath you, you can really start to let this system, because what you're really doing is unkinking the body and letting more and more flow happen. So the more you're in touch with the feelings of your body, the more you can, easier, easier you can do that. I think the reason that it's, hard, I think it's literally harder today to get changes in, in, in people than it was in the 50s and 60s and 40s and 20s um, if you all know who Dave Elman was, he's a famous hypnotist, and he could drop people into such deep trance states, it was, it was incredible. And there's a book, I have the Elman, um, the book just called Hypnotherapy, that's all it's called. And he didn't do anything crazy. What he would do was mostly regression, current life regression, not past life. Like two or two, two when you were one. Uh, he could regress people to remember their births. He could regress people to remember like crazy stuff. And they called it the Elman induction. Everybody wanted to learn the Elman induction. They thought there was something special about the Elman induction that made people go to these deeper states and better states of trance than anybody else. And it wasn't the Elman induction. It was Elman himself it was a big piece of it. Um, he could get people into coma state. Before that, um, the only person that could do that was an Easdell, and I think in the 1840s. He used to put people into what he called the Easdell state at the time, which was this deep state of trance that was so blissed out you could do open, he would do open stomach surgery with no pain because they didn't have um, any other way to sedate people. And he had to do open stomach surgery. And so people would go into total bliss states and they were just, they were in such a bliss state. They're literally identified, the way I see it, they're identified up here. He's got them so deep, they're just sitting up here, disassociated from here and not feeling anything. So Elman starts working on recreating the state. It took Easdell four hours to get people there and uh, of trances, in and out, in and out, you take them in, you take them out. Elman was able to start duplicating it in much shorter, I can't remember how long, but he was able to get radically shorter time periods of time. He could get people to that same state and he started calling it coma state. And the reason he called it coma state is that people would go in and he got curious about it because it would, other hypnotherapists would get people there by accident. Like one in a, a billion trances and suddenly somebody goes there and the hypnotherapist never knew what to do because the people didn't want to come out. So we'd say, you know, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, eyes open, wide awake. And the student would just sit there and not move. They'd be wide, wide awake, wake up, wake up, and they wouldn't come out. And so a lot of the, um, the uh, students, or a lot of the hypnotherapists didn't know what to do with these students. Some of them would freak out. They'd be like, they're stuck, I don't get it. And so Elman finally got his first person there, and then he started to invite them to come out, and they wouldn't come out. So then he decided to get creative. And um, he did things like scream all the buildings on fire to see what they would do, uh, didn't come out. He put a match in their hand and lit it on fire and let it burn down. Because he said you could put their hand in there and they would just leave it. They wouldn't even move it. They'd hold it in the air for an hour, just sitting there. And he said, so I put a match in their hand and they held it and they, it burned. It burned all the way down to their fingers and they just moved their fingers just enough for the match to drop and just sat there. And stuff like this was going on. Really trippy stuff. And he's like, after working with a bunch of people, he finally figured out how to get them out. Because he said there was, what he figured out one was there was nothing wrong with them. Because when they finally came out, one, and one of the ways they would finally come out is they'd have to go to the bathroom so bad they would come out. That was the, how he first got about. And then he'd ask them, why don't you come out when I tell you to come out? And they said, because it's so beautiful, I don't want to leave this space. And I'm ignoring you. It feels so good. So they're basically in a really high state of trance or meditation. 
and then they're blissed out. And they don't want to go back to the physical body. Just like when people have their near-death experiences, they talk about how I didn't want to go back into the body. Well, it's the same thing. They don't want to go back to the body because they don't want to feel everything again. And, but eventually the body has to go bath, bathroom enough or something like that. And, um, and so they eventually do come out. So he figured out, what he, the one thing he said that would work pretty consistently was I would say to him, um, if you don't come out of this state right now, I'm never going to put you back in this state again. If you ever want to go back and enjoy this state again, you better come out right now. And they would come, then boom, they'd start coming out. And that was the only thing he said that worked. Now, he said that state was terrible for suggestion. You couldn't suggest anything because nothing went in. You know, there was a terrible, you want lighter states for suggestion where there's some cognitive reality. Um, but that state was great for pain control. And that's what it was primarily used for. And, and still, even today, most hypnotherapists can't get people there. I've never tried. It'd be interesting to try. Um, but the beauty, the, the beauty of that is, is that why, and I was kind of went on a tangent there, but if you look back in time, that was in the, around the 50s, I think, that uh, Elman was doing this. And... And he was doing a lot of crazy uh, path, uh, current life regression where he's bringing up really deep buried shit and causing people to heal of all kinds of stuff. Like a trauma from when she, uh, a lady was five years old and suddenly this, her eczema goes away or something, you know, things like that. He was having regular success with stuff where those hypnotherapists don't have that level of success. And I think today it's even harder. And the reason I think it's harder is because we have such strong critical minds today. And if you go back before the internet, before all this marketing and advertising and billboards and this fast moving world, a fraction of the information came at you in one day and then comes at you now. Matter of fact, if you think about it, uh, they say that if you go back a few hundred years, that people got more, get more information in one day than they used to get in a year. Okay? And that, how thick does that make the thinking part of your mind? news, newspapers, cell phones, TVs, click, 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 bling, bling, bling. It used to get up. Everything was almost the same all the time. Not much changed. So the critical part of your mind was not huge. Matter of fact, most people, I was watching a show, and it was based, it was a period piece, and they were in the 1740s, and these people were, they were really doing good to try to, working hard to try to make it seem realistic. And you see how these people are really integrated into some crazy deep beliefs. But then, one of the characters on the show said, you got to think about it. Most of these people live their whole lives never going a, more than a mile or two from their home. And that's how they live their whole lives. And a mile or two is a long distance for them because they got to do it by horseback or a few miles, 10 miles. They don't go very far. They don't see the world. They don't learn new things. All they believe is what the local church, people, town tells them. That's their whole belief system. And they're really indoctrinated into that. Whether it's fairies or Christian or Buddhist or Muslim, they get real indoctrinated into what the local beliefs are. And that's the whole world to them. And that's it. It doesn't change. Today, we have, you have every belief under the sun available to you in a moment's notice. What took, if you wanted to dr fly from, or, or if you wanted to go from here to, let's say, San Diego back then, how long would it take? by horseback, through rugged terrain. I'm just guessing, I don't know, a few days, maybe a week, I don't know. How long would it take? Now, if I want, I could probably get to Romania faster today than they could to San Diego. And w in an air-conditioned plane with a comfortable seat watching movies, bitching about having to be in a plane. Okay? And so, with all of this information coming in at me, why I'm on the plane. So we think a lot today. We need something to punch through that thinking mechanism. So I think back in the day, if I tranched you, the critical mind would relax so much, I could get access to deep shit really fast. Today, that, that thing is so thick. We just, we got defenses galore for everything. We've seen it all and we're ready to defend against it all. YouTube's every new marketing ploy. We pretty soon see the marketing ploy and we're like, oh, you know. You don't like it. The new way they do the title headlines. The new way, everything has to change constantly. So, I want to teach you to start untying that critical mind a little bit. 
but still being aware enough that you don't get programmed by society easily. The critical mind is there to protect you. And if you meet somebody like a true somnambulist, a sleepwalker that doesn't have a strong critical mind, they get programmed so fast by the world. They get pulled this direction, that direction, this direction. It's really kind of a problem in the modern society. Old days, maybe it wasn't as bad. I have worked on them in hypnosis and it's, it's a trip. The littlest thing happens and they've got a fear to it. A balloon pops near them, they're afraid of balloons. They, one girl came to me because she couldn't turn left on their car anymore because she had gotten a slight accident turning left and she would go into shakes to turn left in her car. So she had to go around the block to the right, go all the way around this way like this. Everything had to be to the right. And she wanted me to desensitize that and, and remove that trauma. And um, I started talking to her. She was a true somnambulist. She had all kinds of fears. Balloons were one of them. She'd freak out over balloons. She'd freak out over the balloon pop near her, same thing, you know. So this part of your mind, you gotta learn, if you can't, if, you, if you're gonna loosen the critical mind, which is really important, it's gonna give you access to all your deepest stuff, then you've also gotta learn to release and ground everything that comes to you so you don't stay taking on new garbage and new programs that don't work and, and, and that don't work for you, okay? So, um, so that's what releasing does. And so embodiment helps you to start getting into the body and helps you to start moving from a, a more conscious place. If we want to heal the world's problems, we want to heal your problems, the, the only real solution is consciousness. I mean, you can join any political party you want, but that stuff's going to, it doesn't, it, the, the true solution is consciousness. We raise consciousness, people will figure out answers. We'll rise above fighting, competition with consciousness. So raising your own consciousness is the most valuable thing you can do for the world and for yourself. And that's, that's where you'll find the path out. That's why meditation has such a huge change in people's lives. It makes people happy. But meditation has its fault or has problems too. Meditation, I see some people learn to meditate in a bubble and then they block the outside world and they're really blissed out in their little bubbles but as soon as they come out into the world again, they can't function. So they get addicted to their meditations or they become resentful of meditation because it didn't change their life. Because they didn't use it. They didn't learn to flow with it. I've seen people use meditation to numb out. Um, and so, but it's a powerful tool when done properly. And I think the basis of releasing is learning to feel your body, which is a moving meditation while feeling everything. You wanna let everything in. When you feel a sound, you let it run through you. You don't push it away. That's, that's what the new thought movement, unfortunately, everybody started pushing everything away, the positive thought movement. And that's not correct. If you say, if you have the, if somebody like, a, <laughs> this is a true story. I said to this girl once, she said, do you want to join our, um, our support group for something? I don't remember what it was, it was in a program. And then it's like, we all meet every week. And I said, no, nah. I said, um, I said, uh, there's one I was in and it was a real clusterfuck and I, I just don't want to do another one right now or something like that. I said, clusterfuck. And she literally plugged her ears and said, oh, negative thinking, negative thinking. She started spinning in circles. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? She's like, I'm trying to keep that negative thought from going in. And I'm like, I'm like, this is, this is the problem with the positive thought movement. She was so, she called herself an embodiment specialist, but she couldn't feel her own body because she was so up here. Oh, everything's great. Everything's beautiful. I'm happy. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're completely fucking insane inside. <laughs> um, you could see the, like, that look, like, right, I'm happy. Hi. And you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And, um, and so learning to get a little more real and then and, and understanding that true growth happens from relationship to your starting point and building a healthy relationship to your end point. What, the, what a lot of people were doing, and that, trust me, I love the New Thought Movement. Some of the teachings in the New Thought Movement are some of the best out there. Some Thomas Troward and uh, Walt, uh, well, Walter Russell's not really New Thought. Um, kind of, Thomas Troward, people like that, uh, Wallace Waddles. Um, but they, they, they really got how to focus the mind. What we're doing with releasing is taking it even... Hmm? Oh, okay. Okay, give me one second. What we're really doing is getting to... When you understand that and you understand what drives your ability to focus the mind that's up here, when you can build a relation to this and then use new thought to focus this, then you can create anything you want. Okay? Go for it, Vincent. This happened around late 1800s, early 1900s. 
tons of books were written about consciousness and the mind, and they were some of the best books ever written. And you can understand why early Ameri why the United States grew so big to the most powerful country in the world so fast, because our whole constitution and everything was really, they really got our founding fathers, this how to focus the mind and new thought and, and all that stuff. They were just brilliant at it. And it kind of got lost in the middle of the 20th century and everybody, um, but they, re and so there's, there's books like uh, Wallace Waddles, The Science of Getting Rich, um, As a Man Thinketh, these are all new thought books. Uh, 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 Robert Russell, is it Robert Russell? Uh, As God Works Through Faith, which is a, uh, there was a lot of Christianity in the new thought movement, uh, but very focused metaphysical Christianity. Um, uh, principles on faith, um, there's a whole bunch of them. Is there an yeah, Ernest Holmes, yeah. Um, and his t there was a woman before him, I can't remember her name. There's one of the earliest ones is written by this woman. I have it somewhere, I need to read it, but it was supposed to be a really good read. It's in the 1800s. Just such a powerful read. A lot of them, you know, like, As a Man Thinketh and Wallace Waddle's book all are like 1910-ish, right around there. Or they're just, they're great reads. And they, they're written in that old English style. And then, or like, um, there's some other deep thought books from that time too. I wouldn't necessarily say that they're, they're new thought, but like Edinburgh Lectures on a Mental Science, that was around 19, early 1900s, 1901, 1910. It was a British judge in, uh, living in India wrote it. It's, such a, it's a really thick piece of work though. You gotta read it a few times, you know, to get through it. Uh, but there's tons of them and they're, they're really, they kind of disappeared. They're out there, but you have to go dig for them, you know. One of the best ones is God Works Through Faith. I read that. I've read that over and over and over and over. I just read it again this week. I did it on audio. That piece of work is so powerful. It's a treatment on understanding faith, which is the energy that, that causes you to create. Um, it's from the Christian perspective written in the book, but you don't have to be Christian to really get the value out of it. You can understand that faith is an energy. It's a principle. It's a, it's, it's, and faith should have a feeling to it. And you're gonna understand that as we go through the emotions, you're gonna understand that cap, getting high up in cap is equivalent to developing faith in a lot of ways. It's this energy of belief and expectancy that, and this knowing and not telling yourself you know, I just know this is gonna happen. You ever known something was gonna happen through your whole body, not state pump, not thinking, yeah, it's gonna happen, and it did. That's faith. And faith should have works, it should have results, you should have like, and that's what releasing does, it develops this sense that you, you start to build this faith, you're building faith in releasing, and faith in money is going to show up, and there's, there's a, and there's a warm, fuzzy feeling before it shows up, isn't there? There's this warm sense of everything's perfect, and then boom, it comes into your life. And the feeling precedes the results, and that book is a treatment on programming yourself, it's not a how-to, it's a treatment. It's a subconscious reprogramming on being able to believe in yourself. That's really what I, it's better way supposed to put the book teaches you how to believe in your ability to manifest. Okay. God works through faith. It's a neat book because it, um, it was out of print for many years and the only way you could get one was to buy a thousand dollar original copy. Um, and people would. People would buy a thousand. Uh, David Nagel bought the um, he heard about it from Bob Proctor, who was his teacher, but he could never find a copy. And Bob said, if you ever find a copy, grab it. And he searched for it for years, and then he finally found one online and bought it for $1,000. Now you can buy it online, and it's on audio on YouTube too. Somebody recorded it on audio, and now you can, there's somebody reprinted it, and it's online. But um, David Nagel did a little reprinting too. But, um, but it, um, he bought the, an original for $1,000 and, and it got mailed to him. And then when he opened it up, it was Bob Proctor's original copy that he'd given away to a poor a person who really needed it, who was struggling. It had all of Bob Proctor's notes in it and everything. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, so literally got what he was focusing on. Um, so, um, so faith is a real energy. Okay, let's get back to where we are at. And um, so we wanted to, uh, I want to develop your minds to understand these principles of, 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 we're really here to learn alignment. Emotions are misalignment or alignment. The far, the heavier the emotion, the more out of alignment with what you want or perceive that you want you are. Emotions are a guidance system. They guide you and they show you if you're creating or 
anti-creating. I never put it that way either, but anti-creating what you want, pushing away what you want. It's not like you just, if you're out of, way out of alignment, like in apathy, grief, and fear, it's not that you're just not creating money, you're probably creating the opposite of what you're asking for. You think about making millions, but you're in apathy, grief, and fear, and so you create more poverty. And then you spread that to everybody around you. Because of the heavy thinking, the victim consciousness spreads, the martyrdom spreads, the energy, those heavy energies spread. You know what I'm talking about? And they spread. And they connect to everybody else. But all that can be broken up. All that can be released. The first year of releasing can be one of the biggest changing, if you do it consistently every day, it can change your whole life. The second year can blow you up. Okay? Some people blow up in the first few months. I mean, she's already been doing it since November and her life's radically shifted. I got her and my other sister doing it and now my mom is crying every day and, and our mom and apologizing for everything she ever did to us in childhood. So it affects everybody around you, okay? Is that not true? <laughs> yeah, New Year's Eve was, a, because it was right after, it was New Year's Eve where mom just couldn't stop crying. She was letting it all out and apologizing, apologizing, apologizing. And she's and my other sister says she's becoming sweeter and sweeter. The more these, they release, the sweeter she's becoming. So, we affect everybody around us. I was just gonna, add, I was just gonna say one thing I didn't say before, and I, I didn't realize that people react to me differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you? What did I say to you? I said you, you really push people away, and I remember I told you that. And then, that, then you said, you know what my brother told me to that guy? What did he say? Oh. Um, that my body language, you know, says a lot. I said, and he said, oh yeah, it means stay away. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been, I'd been telling her that all weekend. <laughs> yeah, I just, because I sit in my back and keep people at arm's distance. And yeah. And you and Chris are the complete opposite. So my other sister's always in the front of her body trying to get, and Becky's always in the back saying stay away. Mm -hmm. And they were doing the complete opposite defense mechanisms. And so Chris is learning to not chase and Becky's learning to let people in. And I had to learn to let people in because I always pushed everybody away too. That was my, I was more like Becky. Okay, growing up, and I was keep everybody back, I don't want anybody in. And so, um, so now I, um, I really enjoy socializing for that reason because it was really hard for me in the beginning. It was a lot of work, it took a lot of practice and then when releasing really sped that up. Last night was a blast. Becky didn't think so. I took her to the bungalow. <laughs> How did you like it? Um, I just felt like a fish out of water. Like I just, it's been a long time since I've been in that kind of environment. And uh, what did you, you told me I was, I was like a... Oh, you were racing out of the bungalow. <laughs> we walked out and she's like heading to the car like it. I'm like, slow down. And she's like, what? I'm not hurrying. What are you talking about? And she's just like, and I was like, okay. And, uh, but it was a blast and uh, I, I talked to a lot of people and it was so much fun and, and it was good. She got to see what, some of what we do for a living. A lot of students were there. Well, I talk, you know, I'm a teacher so I talk all day, but it's just, it's different. Controlled environment. Yeah, it's just a different, yeah. yeah. you can be talk, I could talk up here all day and be completely shy. Singers do it all the time. They get on stage and they're the most outgoing people. They get off stage, they don't talk to anybody. Super common stuff. Because you could, I have control. You out there, I don't have control. You put me in the bungalow, I have to submit more. That's a different energy. So you have to be able to open and relax. Okay, so grounding, the opening up the body, learning to feel more. That's what movement's about. That's what feeling's about. We do a lot of this in all our week longs, whether it's this week long or we do the other week long. We do, uh, don't do as nearly as much here, but I want you guys to take a moment and, um, and I'm gonna go through some stuff with you guys and just take a moment, set your stuff down and, and we'll, We'll play with this. Okay. And just take a moment and allow yourself to experience what you're experiencing right now, whatever that is. And just observe it. Let the experience come to you don't chase the experience, whatever that means. Just let, you, let that, ha that idea set in. You don't have to understand it totally. But let the experience come to you, come to your consciousness. 
And then just start scanning your body and notice what your body feels like. Notice what the different parts of your body feel like. And then welcome, allow, acknowledge. Just pick one of those words or any word similar that fits for you. Some people like allow, some people like acknowledge. Any part of your body that's in resistance. Or you're having a hard time feeling. And then welcome any part of your body that's in wanting or chasing, trying to feel more, that's like eager. I gotta get this right, I gotta do this now. Just notice what that feels like. Welcome any part of your body that's actually just flowing, relaxing. Notice what that feels like. And now welcome it all at once. Let it all just be. Let yourself push, let yourself pull, and just step back a little farther and watch it, observe it. Now begin to become aware of the earth beneath you, beneath you. Feel the ground beneath your feet, feel your ass in the chair, feel the weight of your body, as much as your body's willing, without forcing, just allow or acknowledge. And then notice if there's any resistance to that, and welcome that too. You don't have to get rid of it, just welcome it. And then begin to notice if there's any part of your body that you're physically tightening around the ass, around the perineum taint, around the asshole, the lower back, just notice, check this whole area out, scan, see if you can just, even if it's just a micro 1% relaxation, and see if you can feel down beneath you a little more with that relaxation, the base of the spine, And then begin to allow that relaxation to spread down the back of the legs. Or whatever feeling you're feeling, just become aware of the back of your legs. And if for any reason the back of your legs want to tighten more, let them do it for a little bit. If they're ready to just let go, let go. And then welcome any part of yourself that's checking these areas out and trying to force your body to relax. Just notice any forcing or wanting, chasing, needing, craving. These are different words. Just acknowledge that now. Now see if you can just let any of that wanting, needing, chasing, or craving go. And just allow the experience to come to you again. And then one more time, check the perineum. See if it's loose, the taint. Check the muscles around the ass, whole, and then the glutes themselves. And see if you can loosen those a little bit, if they want to, there's no forcing. And then welcome around the base of the spine again, so you can start to feel up your spine. See if there's any sense of sinking down into the chair. Now, again, scan the back of your legs. And let yourself feel down the back of your legs. All the way to the heel. The Achilles and the heel. Begin to notice if there's any tension in the Achilles, the heel or the ankle. Begin to let that go. And then welcome any tension in the bottom of the feet. If any muscle in the bottom of the foot is a little tight, or just sometimes it's not even tension, it's just lack of awareness. Like my consciousness wasn't even aware I had feet. I'm just going to move it there and start to feel the weight of the ground beneath my feet. And see if I can relax into it. And just notice what that feels like. And see if you can get a sense now that you can see through the ground with your feet. You can feel through the ground with your feet. See, feel, have a knowing. Any of these words work. 
And the same thing with the ass. As you relax the ass one more time, see if there's a sense you can feel through the cushions all the way into the ground. See, for some of you, if you can get a sense, you can see through the floor and through all four floors beneath you, all the way down into the earth, maybe even to the center of the earth. And let all the outside noises be part of the grounding. Matter of fact, this is your grounding. It's just like grounding wire on a car or in the electronics. And as noise comes at you, like from the car that just came, let it come into your grounding mechanism and ground you. Let it run through and ground into the earth so that no noise can affect you. That it actually comes in and through you. You just relax into it. Now I'm going to clap and I want you to allow the clap go through your body. Notice if you, how much of your body you resist and how much you let in. One, two, three. See if you can just let that run through your body. I'm going to do it again. Let it run through. Let your body feel it and relax in the clap, into all the areas we just talked about. Whatever that means. You don't have to get it perfect. Just allow yourself to get it exactly the way you get it. And just notice what that feels like. Now ask your body to let go a little bit more. With each clap, just let go a little deeper. With each bit of noise in the background, let go a little deeper. And now begin to allow your spine to wake up. As you feel this energy, which is just energy coming through you, See if you can feel a sense that your spine is waking up all the way to the top of your head and you begin to feel out the top of your head. So now you have a sense you're going into the ground beneath you and you're also feeling up into the sky above you. And it all just runs right through you. Matter of fact, if I was to come over and clap right in front of you, you would just let it run right through you. And just notice how that feels. Does it feel good? Does it feel relaxing? Now welcome any part of yourself that's thinking about what I'm doing. And notice what that feels like. And just watch those thoughts. You don't need to get rid of them. Imagine they're little fluffy clouds in the sky. And no thought is actually you. You're just the sky. And you can just watch those, cloud, those thoughts, no matter what they are, float by. Knowing you're the cloud, you're the sky, you're not the clouds. You're the big, expansive, endless blue sky. Watching these little harmless clouds. They're mostly just vapor, gas or something like that, float by. And just like the clouds, the car is a heavier energy, but it's still just a thought passing by. The truck, the plane in the air. And your body can receive it all or let it go. Now, could you perceive these sounds without your body? Are these sounds really separate from you? I mean, you're not hearing them at a distance, you're hearing them inside your body, so how do you even know they're real? How do you know it's not just a projection of this body? So welcome that idea for a moment. And then again, begin to check in with the ass and the perineum, the glutes, the back of the legs, and just let everything flow through you again. And notice how you feel. See if you can feel every time a car goes by as if it can ground you more. You use the car to go deeper. Every little noise takes you deeper. Every little sensation relaxes you deeper into this part of your body as you're building a relationship through your grounding to the outside world. Letting go of everything that was in resistance to that. What if you could just let go of all resistance right now? What if you could just let go of all thoughts to the contrary? 
Now letting go is not a doing process. It's a stopping process. It's doing less. If you're holding on to something and you relax your hand, that's how you let go. You don't, re you don't throw it, you re actively relax and let it fall away. So I'm gonna ask you one more time to just look for any tension that's in these parts of your body and just let go. And let yourself sink deeper and notice how you feel. And notice how many sounds you can hear in the background. How many sensations you feel. All these sensations are always there. Most of the time we're tuning them out. And it's the same as tuning out the reality you want to create. Your, the reality you want to create, whether it's relationship, money, sex, health, is all right there, but most of the time you're tuning it out. And all you have to do is relax into it. So again, imagine, instead of holding on to an idea, that you relax and let the idea flow through you. If the idea is relationship, relax and let it flow through you. If the idea is money, relax and let it flow through you. And see if you can just sink a little deeper. Now when you're ready, slowly come back into the room, open your eyes, see if you can maintain some of this feeling with eyes open. I do a lot of eye open meditations too, closed and eye open. I do a lot of walking, moving out in the street meditations, because I want, I, just as much as I want to do really deep closed eyed stuff, and I do that on a regular basis, I also want to do stuff out here so I can bring the two together. So I can get this depth, take that depth of feeling I get from the closed eyes and start to get that present walking down the street, talking to people. So I'm always bringing them together so that it's not a separate thing. Now you'll always get the deepest with your eyes closed. But you can also shut off from the world with your eyes closed. So we want to eliminate that behavior too. <laughs>